think English has contributed to what I have noticed in the last 30 or 40 years, a great sense of nationhood in India. You know, when I was young, again, there was an idea that you might split up. And we thought, you know, we are an unified country. And I have been impressed every time I go to India with the great sense I feel amongst anyone I meet that they are Indian first, mm -hmm. whatever else they might be. Well, I, I think that uh, I would not exaggerate the usefulness of the English language in that respect. N even though my own uh, background is of somebody who was educated in English in India, who has written in English, who thinks in English, and whose engagement with uh, major Indian issues has been in English. So for me, it would be easy to say yes, but I would say objectively that um, that has not been as significant, I suspect, as the processes of Indian democracy, which ultimately by making people of every background, including every linguistic background, feel equally at home and equally capable of ascending to power, uh, that has, I think, helped keep people knit together. Separatism is often the result of a feeling that you are going to be permanently on the margins. In India, no section of our society needs to feel that. Uh, we have had presidents, governors, uh, generals, uh, Supreme Court justices, and so on and so forth, chief election commissioners from various parts uh, of, the, of the, the land of, of India. And that has meant that no one needs to feel that from the moment of birth, there is some office, some position, some stature whether it be captain of the cricket team or the top ranking Bollywood star or the chief election commissioner running the country's elections or the president of India, that there is some position that is somehow close to them because of the language they speak, the color of their skin, the shape of their eyes, you know, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, religion they profess, etc. And that is something that uh, has been India's greatest strength in my view. Pluralism, diversity, which you and I have uh, cherished as, as liberal minded people, uh, has to have a practical meaning. And the practical meaning is no one feels left out. That, I think, is important, in my view, uh, for every multi-ethnic society, including yours, but particularly ours. I mean, I am a relative newcomer to politics. I joined it uh, just before plunging into the electoral fray in 2009. But in the 2004 elections, we saw the extraordinary phenomenon in India of an election being won by a political party headed by a woman leader of Catholic faith and Italian descent, who then made way for a Sikh to be sworn in as prime minister by a Muslim president in a country 81% Hindu. You know, that's the sort of diversity that India stands for, and for which, frankly, there are far too few parallels. We all applauded rightly when President Obama was elected in America. But it also reminded us that for 220 years of free and fair elections before that, America had never elected a president or a vice president who'd been anything but white, male, and Christian. So democracy and pluralism uh, must, after all, reinforce each other. And in India, that has happened. There's also now mass communications. Television has become an extraordinary force for national integration in India, sometimes in an unhealthy way, in a chauvinistic way, mm -hmm. but very often in a much more serious uh, uh, binding people together, making people aware of each other way, which I think is, is, is also a great strength for us. And Sri Lanka can certainly draw strong lessons from all of that. I think you're absolutely correct. I, I always look back to 1984 and the Indian suppression of separatism in uh, the Punjab. But I think the fact that then the officials who implemented government policy were themselves Sikh. And many of the police and the military involved were Sikh officers and Sikh soldiers. So that is one disadvantage you have in that you have not had a, a, a strong Tamil presence in your armed forces and your police. That's forces. absolutely correct. I think we need to take steps to remedy that. I think we did have a problem because we did have several Tamil officers and you'll find that at senior levels we still do have them. But they were, I'm afraid, under threat. I mean, particularly during 2002-2003, the LTT was very clever. They did not kill any Sinhalese. They killed the Tamils, whom they, of course, accused of being traitors, like our foreign minister Lakshman Kadirgam and Neelam Thiruchalvam earlier. Uh, but particularly in the armed forces, the Tamils and the Muslims suffered inordinately. I hope now that the LTD threat has gone, we will proactively do what you've suggested and engage many more Tamils and Muslims into the armed forces, and in particular the police. We have had a fast track for Tamil policemen, but I would agree we need to do more. Um, if I could move on to something else relating to your other experience as a senior UN official. 
One factor that I had noticed recently is, uh, 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 let's say, preponderance of a, a different style of Union official. They tend to be Western much more than in the past. You know, when I was young, it was the heyday of India, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka as in the UN, plus a lot of Africans and so on. But the UN was not dominantly white. I felt it was, in recent years, much more a unipolar mentality. And secondly, and this was actually told me by a very distinguished Indian diplomat, uh, Sashwan Singh, who was the permanent representative of India at Geneva. And he told me it's not only that, it's the mindset that a lot of these people who now come into the UN do not have public service experience. They come in from the NGO sector, they go back to the NGO sector, and therefore they almost see that the UN is the opponent of government. And especially when they disagree with governments, they think they have a mission to correct this. Uh, would you agree that there's been a sort of change in the UN in the last 20 years? I, I wouldn't draw a sweeping conclusion like that simply because my own experience of the UN was over three decades and I saw various patterns at various times. Um, the, which is the UN you're seeing in a sense? The humanitarian side of the UN has always been infused with uh, a bit of, if you like, missionary zeal. And I don't mean that in a religious sense. Mm. I mean it in the sense of trying to bring about positive change. I myself spent 11 years at the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. And uh, though we had Indians and Sri Lankans and so on, yes, there was a strongly Western uh, component because a lot of the humanitarian work gets very strong political and financial support from a handful of Western donor countries who inevitably have a strong influence on the approach uh, of the organization and indeed in some of the senior appointments. Whereas if you look at some of the other sides of the UN, on the political side, for example, there's much more variety of political leadership. The UN in Africa is not uh, politically uh, a particularly strongly white-centered organization. Mm. I would say it's, it's visibly less Western in terms of leadership and presence than it used to be uh, in the 60s or 70s, um, and so on and so forth. I think you will find divergent patterns. Um, one thing I think uh, also uh, is true that when the organization as a whole was headed by Europeans, as happened a lot the first, I think three of the first five secretaries general were European. At that time, they were more attentive to the need to balance themselves with African and Asian senior officials around them. But when you have Africans and Asians heading the UN, as we've seen with Kofi Annan and Ban Ki-moon, the converse applies and they feel all the more obliged to have Western officials uh, around them uh, to show that they are not converting the organization into mirrors of themselves. So perhaps uh, it would be unfair to draw sweeping conclusions from this. Uh, many of the people whom I, I know have come to Sri Lanka have had NGO backgrounds, but they've also been some who have actually come from the world of diplomacy. Uh, the UN Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs was a distinguished British diplomat uh, and um, uh, therefore used, in fact, to conducting himself um, in a diplomatic manner. But nonetheless, his natural constituency as a humanitarian official is the constituency of NGOs, human rights advocates, humanitarian organizations. And he would, be, uh, he would have to be sort of tone deaf not to be sensitive to the expectations and demands of that constituency. So all of these things have to be borne into, 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 into account. I do believe it would be healthy for the UN to have a senior humanitarian official or officials from developing countries, from the countries where these problems really exist rather than from the donor countries. If you look now that the High Commissioner for Refugees is a Westerner, the uh, Under Secretary for Humanitarian Affairs is a Westerner, the um, head of UNICEF is an American, as has always been, and so on. You're looking at uh, a UN, and the whole, who, head of the World Food Program is also an American. You're looking at a UN humanitarian apparatus that inevitably is perceived in many of the developing countries to be very, very strongly Western. I think that's unfortunate because it's truly an international organization in the ranks are people of all backgrounds, it would be good if the leadership were also a little more diverse. Of course, one way perhaps of dealing with this mindset is uh, much more capable uh, civil servants in one's own country. Now, India, I think, still has an extraordinarily distinguished civil service. It's foreign service. Have you been complaining so about the slowness of our bureaucracy? <laughs> um, well, as I said, to start with, it's better than ours, <laughs> even though uh, it does have uh, problems. And sometimes one might wonder whether that slowness is also part of their feeling that perhaps a message should be sent that things have to move forward. But I'm sure we'll be able to remedy that. Um, I was just wondering about uh, 
not only for Sri Lanka but also for SARC in general. Is there a case perhaps for moving forward training of our bureaucrats, maybe even of our politicians, in international affairs? I know that the SARC university is about to get off the ground, right. but it hasn't moved as fast perhaps as we would like. And is there a case perhaps for more joint programs of training, of getting our bureaucrats to work together, both to coordinate with each other, but also to present, let's say, a professional approach that would rival the professionalism of organizations like the UN? No, I would agree with that, though in fact the UN is an odd panel because the UN doesn't have a very effective training mechanism itself. It really takes people who have already been trained in their national systems yeah. or whatever their previous professional lives were, and it uses them. My own instinct would be that yes, we could do a lot more in training because developing human capital is one of the prime neglected tasks of development. And India 